Shabbat Shalom everybody and welcome to our community Kehilat Bethlehem. This week's Torah portion is Parsha Vayagash. We have almost come to the last part of the book of Genesis. The Hebrew word Vayagash means and he drew near which is basically a reference to Judah or Yehuda drawing near to his brother Joseph whom at this time is, uh, is uh, basically the second individual in command in all of Egypt or Mitzrayim, which, which is Pharaoh, the, actually is the right-hand man of Pharaoh himself. This Torah portion deals with the consummation of the revelation of Yosef to his brothers. He's revealing himself to his brothers this week. This week, once again, it deals with the reconciliation of Joseph and his family. And the message of the Torah portion is one of the most important messages that we need to understand, understand, know, and apply. Application is the most critical thing. The story of Yosef is spread in four Torah portions. Pasha Vayeshev, Pasha Miketz, Pasha Vayagash and Pasha Vayaki. Basically all the way from Genesis chapter 37 through chapter 50. And every time we read these portions, the question that comes to our minds is that how was it able, how was Yosef able to forgive his brothers? Especially after what happened to him, after what they did to him. Anyone who has been hurt, anyone who has been wounded like Yosef, would you be able to forgive somebody like this? Especially if you're from the same community. It is, it is unbelievable. This is, this, the whole story of Yosef is a story of forgiveness, restoration, restitution, reconciliation. In, it basically blows, it should blow our mind every time. Especially for the fact that Joseph is a type of Mashiach. And remember that when he was on the cross, the scripture says that what was his last words? Forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. But if you consider the words, consider the life of Joseph and what his brothers did to him and to completely forgive him. This is really unbelievable. Not just the selling part, but every part. What would you do if such a thing happened to you? In fact, there is this story told by uh, Rabbi Abba. Uh, Rabbi Abba is basically the one who inscribed the Zohar. In, he, he basically tells a story, an incident he shares with his disciples. That, that one time when he went to the city of Lod, which is basically 150 kilometers south of Safed, and close to Jerusalem, and he was going to the city and he saw this individual sleeping. You know, I mean, I guess that during those days, it was common for people to sleep uh, on the roadside, take a nap, things of that nature, before uh, the world became metroplex and complex in nature, when life was very simple. So this person was basically leaning on a tree, sitting down and sleeping. And suddenly he sees a big snake coming down from the tree. And as it was about to bite him, a branch basically falls and kills the snake. And this rabbi is basically stunned with what he saw. He's basically witnessing a miracle before him. He doesn't, the guy who is sleeping doesn't even know that this miracle has happened. And how his life has been saved. After some time, the man basically wakes up and he's, he's about to go and tell this guy who woke up about the miracle that he witnessed. He was basically standing on kind of a, you know, on top of a hill. It was like a landslide. It's, so in other words, that where the sand was basically loose, he could have slipped and he could have fallen over the cliff. So what happened again, he just stripped and he fell to the ground and nothing happened to him. So here before him, he witnesses two miracles 
And this rabbi goes and asks him, you must be a hidden zadik, meaning a righteous man. I just witnessed with my own eyes two times, just in these last couple of hours, you were supposed to die and somehow some force had come and saved you. You must be a hidden zadik. The man tells him, no, 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 rabbi, I'm just a regular person. The rabbi said, no, it's impossible. You cannot be a normal, you cannot be a, a, a normal person, a regular person, especially after I just witnessed two miracles happening for you, something has happened. The man says, I'm not a zadik. Then, then the rabbi said, then you must be doing some very important mitzvah. You must be doing some special mitzvah. Because after what I witnessed, something you do in your life is the reason for your protection, for your covering. So the guy basically says, I do have one mitzvah that I do every day. And he says, I never go to sleep angry. I always let go. And I let go anything that anybody ever did to me. It doesn't matter if it was their fault. It doesn't matter if it was not their fault. I take into consideration, maybe they had a bad day. Maybe I caught them in the wrong time. Something happened to them. So I always make it a point to forgive them every single day. Everybody, before I go to sleep, I never go to sleep angry. And apart from that, I make sure that anyone that does something bad to me, I always return it with a good thing. I return it with gratitude. It's called, uh, there is a prayer which we have in Hebrew called Birkat HaGomel, which is a prayer of gratitude. The Birkat HaGomel is basically a prayer of blessing God. It is, it is, it is recited according to, especially by four types of people. One who has completed a sea voyage or in today's time, we can also air travel. One who has traveled through a wilderness. One who has been sick and who has been delivered. This category also comes among pregnant women who has delivered a child. And one who has been imprisoned and freed. And look at the words of this prayer. The prayer basically says, Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the world who rewards the undeserving with goodness. Hagomel hakhaim tovot. He rewards the undeserving with goodness and who has rewarded me with goodness. This is amazing. Have you done a travel by air? Have you gone through the wilderness? Have you been sick and you have been restored back to health? Have you been impressed? You've been through difficult times. You've come out of it. God has delivered you. Then this is a season. This is what you need to pray. You need to thank God, not by yourself. These are not prayers that are said by yourself. Said in the community and bring a thanksgiving offering unto Hashem by telling the people, witnessing to the people what God has done for you. So this man says that I always make sure even if someone does something bad to me, I always return them with something good. So the Rebbe basically said, you know, I thought in our history, the only righteous person was Yosef Azadik. In fact, if you read the Bible, every one of our ancestors or forefathers have a name. Abraham is known as Avraham Avinu. Moshe is known as Moshe Rabbeinu. Aharon is known as Aharon HaKohen. David is known as David HaMelech. And a lot of, of our heroes of faith, they have some kind of title based on their life and their doing. Yosef got the title Zadik. Yosef HaZadik. This Rabbi Abba said, I thought until now that only Yosef was a Zadik, but you are more righteous than him. And the man said, what? Why do you think so? Because the rabbi said, because Joseph forgave his brothers. I can understand that. But you forgive people who are even strangers. You must be in the level of a zadik. It's easy sometimes to forgive people in the family. 
I know it's not easy. It's a difficult thing. In fact, our master in his prayer, what does he teach us? Remember, the purpose of studying the Torah is not just for knowledge, but the purpose of studying the Torah is basically to verbalize or for for application. If I'm not willing to put into application what I'm learning, then there is no purpose of studying God's word. If I'm not, it's the, studying God's word is not like going to school or going to uh, a university, purposeless study. Majority of today's world or generation have purposeless study. We go to school, most of the subjects we are not even interested in. We go to college, half of the subjects we are not even interested in. But the subjects that we want is not available. Sometimes, many of times, we also study God's word like that. Oh, I'm a believer in Yeshua, or I'm, I go to synagogue, so this is what I do. No. Friends, if you're studying the word of God, it's very important to understand the reason of the study is that you're going to apply it. The words of the master in his prayer, what did he say? In the Lord's prayer, it's also known. It says, Father, forgive us for... Forgive us what we have done wrong as we too have forgiven those who have wronged us. Have you ever thought about that? Just think about what we say for those of us who say the Lord's prayer or the master's prayer. We say, our Father who art in heaven, may your kingdom, may may name be glorified, may your kingdom come as it is on earth, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive. Forgive us what we have done wrong as we too have forgiven those who have wronged us. In other words, we are telling Hashem, Lord, if we have not forgiven others who have wronged us, please don't forgive us. That's what it basically says. In fact, those of us who pray the bedtime Shema, listen to the words of the bedtime Shema. It says over there, Master of the universe, I hereby forgive anyone who has angered me. Now remember the bedtime Shema, like it is known, it is said just before you go to sleep. It is not said on the bed. It is said just a couple of minutes or a couple of sometime just before you're hitting the bed. This is the last activity that we do before hitting the bed. We say, this is the first part of it. Master of the universe, I hereby forgive anyone who has angered me or sinned against me, either physically or financially, against my honor, or anything that is mine, whether accidentally, or intentionally, inadvertently, or deliberately, by speech, or by word, in this incarnation, or any other, any Israelite is forgiven. May no man be punished on my account. May it be your will, Adonai my God, and God of my fathers, that I shall sin no more, nor repeat my sin, neither shall I again anger you, nor do what is wrong in your eyes. The sins I have committed erase in your abounding mercies, but not through suffering or severe illness. May they be acceptable, may may they be acceptable the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart before you, Adonai, my rock and my redeemer. Powerful. If actually, if we learn to live this kind of lifestyle, like this man said, a lifestyle of forgiveness, a lifestyle of reconciliation, a lifestyle without jealousy or envy or rejection, when it comes to seasons like Yom Kippur, there is nothing to do but you're just thanking God for the privilege you're ready. You're already whole. You're already prepared. Yosef in this week's Torah portion is a symbol of forgiveness, of letting go. Because really after what the brothers did to him, he, he had all the right to be upset with them. But the fact that he not only forgave them, he also began treating them well. He took care of them. The scripture says, don't worry, you come and stay with me. I'll take care of you. Whatever you want, I'm going to give you. Not only till his father died, but even after his father died, till the last breath of Joseph's life, he took care of his brothers and their family. The Torah says that he sustained them and their families for the rest of their lives. 
and he says not only that i am not upset you won't have to work anymore i will pay all your expenses all your trips whatever car you want whatever would just come to me i'll just sign the check now i know many of us like to have brothers like this so that i can live cushy cushy life that i don't have to work we all wish to but you know to to pay our bills so that i can relax eat drink and be merry but that's not what's happening over here okay so joseph is a symbol of forgiveness he's a symbol of charity he's a symbol of being kind in fact king david david hamelak he says in psalms 80 he tells hashem please treat us like yosef treat please treat us like yosef now he's saying treat us like yosef not like how you oh god treated yosef that means not not like going through the the paid going through the prison and all that stuff but treat us like the way yosef treated his brothers how with compassion with forgiveness with love yosef is a type of yeshua yeshua also treated his brothers and the nations of the world with the same concept but the sad reality we who call ourselves believers of yeshua don't practice what the master has done we find reason to divide to disperse to run away to find our own clubs so this whole drama of joseph and his brothers which has thus far spanned in two torah portions with eight chapters is filled with tension it's filled with reversals of faith and this week it reaches its climax this week judah the old, one of the older brothers of yosef and joseph basically face one another benjamin the youngest of the sons he stands accused of theft and focuses and faces a lifetime of slavery judah makes an impassionate plea for his release yes the silver cup has been found in benjamin's possession Judah does not challenge the fact instead what does he do he basically throws himself on the mercy of an of the egyptian ruler whose identity he is still not uh, uh, he's unaware of and he begs him to consider the impact of benjamin's imprisonment that will have on his brother on his father yakob jacob has already lost one beloved son the shock of another son is going to kill him see what it says in genesis 44 33 to 34 now therefore this is what judah is saying please let your servant remain here as your lordship slave in the place of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers for how can i go back to my father if the boy is not with me no do not let me see the misery that shall come upon my father these are the words that finally breaks the heart of yosef everything from the beginning the, the of time when he began when he saw his brothers he knew it was his brothers what the scripture says everything that he caused to happen for his brothers it was carefully done because he wanted to see what is the condition of the brothers where they are at spiritually where they are at physically where they are at emotionally the scriptures very clearly say yosef recognized his brothers but his brothers did not recognize recognize him couple of times in other words so everything that is happening the brother's life is not accident it is not a by chance it is not coincidence it is it is something that is planned carefully to help them come to the point of reconciliation restitution and 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 redemption so here he listens to these words he's finally broken he breaks down he begins to cry this is not the only time he cries see oh he's overcome with emotion and he commands his attendants to leave then he turns to his brothers and he reveals his identity what does he say in chapter 45 verses 1 2 and 3 he says then yosef could no longer control himself before all his attendants and he cried have everyone leave my presence so there was no one with yosef when he made himself known to his brothers and he began to weep aloud that that the egyptians and the house of pharaoh heard 
And Yosef said to his brothers, Ani Yosef, I am Yosef. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were not able to answer him for they were, they were terrified at his presence. Who is he? They're standing before someone who is second in charge of Egypt. Now the second in charge of Egypt, the ruler of Egypt, who, who, who is basically saying, I am your brother. I am Yosef, the same guy you threw into the pit, the same guy you, you sold. I am your brother. Their silence is eloquent. They, were, they, they are basically bewildered. The stranger turns out to be their brother. The ruler of Egypt is the boy who years earlier they had sold into slavery. There, this is the combination of shock and guilt, basically paralyzing them. Breaking the silence, Yosef continues. He has yet another surprise for his brothers. What does he say? He says he does not hold them guilty. He says that there is, no, there, is, there is no anger in Joseph's words. Instead, he does the least expected thing. What does he do? He comforts them. He forgives them. And he speaks with majestic graciousness. See what it says later on in chapter 45, verses 4 through 8. He says, then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they came close, he said, I am your brother, Yosef. The one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourself for selling me here. Why? For God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. He understood that this is the hand of God. He understood that is this is hashgaga pratid. That this is divine ordinance. This is divine provision. Hashem has allowed it to happen. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. For the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. But God, Hashem, has sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So it is not you who sent me here, but God. Listen to the words of this man. He has no hatred. He has no revenge. He does not want to do anything. He just is love because he's gone through an experience. It's 22 years since he last saw them. With this, this long story which we've been reading in these last eight, uh, uh, eight chapters of the Torah portion, two Torah portions, it basically reaches a closure. This, this estrangement which began with the words, like I said last week, that the brothers hated him and they could not speak peaceful, peacefully to him. They not only hated him physically, even before something happened physically, by throwing him into the pit, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, intellectually, they hated him in their heart of him. Now it has come to an end. Joseph is, as he, as he, as he twice dreamed, he would be a ruler. His brothers have now bowed down to him. He's, he has survived their attempt to kill him. He, is, he's, he has risen from slavery to become the second most powerful man in the most powerful empire in the ancient world. But there are certain questions which are central, which is very important. What kind of story is this? Is it a fairy tale from rags to riches? Is it a story of revenge? Is it a tragedy of internal dissolution and family infighting? What are the deeper themes playing beneath, beneath this simple reading of the text? What is happening beyond the text? See, when we're reading the Bible, when we're reading the Torah, we should not just understand there is something happening. We need to understand the emotion. This is what application is. People are not able to relate to this is because we don't think this is, this is something that I can do. That's a perfect family. No. This is just any regular family. What's happening here is something really great. So to understand these narratives, we must trace the sequence of events, trying to uncover the intent, driving Yosef into the successful or successive encounters with his brothers. What are the events? Number one, the brothers come 
before Yosef to buy grain. He recognizes them, the scripture says, but they do not recognize him. Then he speaks rashly to them as accusing them of espionage, meaning they are spying. You are spies. You are liars. No, we are not liars. We, we basically come from the land of Canaan. He asked them, where are you coming from? What did they say? We are coming from the land of Canaan. We come to buy food. He didn't ask them, why did you come? We've come to buy food. It's basically, so in the surface level, it's just talking about food. But at a spiritual level, they were basically so desperate. They were spiritually away from God. But now has come the point of their life that they to, that that's going to change their lives forever. So, so because of that, what happened? They, he accused them of being spies. And now they are, in, they're going, they're imprisoned in Egypt, in Mitzrayim for three days. After three days, he releases them. Holding just Shimon as a hostage. And he tells them, you know what? You must bring Benjamin the next time you come to verify your story. Why? Because unbeknown to them, he has put money they had paid for the grain back into their sacks. Discovering this, now the brothers are unnerved. They are anxious. They are anxious. They, they, they begin to hyperventilate. Something is happening to them, but they do not know what. They are returning without Shimon, but with the money instead. It does not make sense to them, but it does evoke in them a guilty conscience. What is it? What is the guilt that is arising within them? Did they not once before sell or at least plan to sell one of their brothers for money? It's arising, it's coming back to them. Remember, 22 years ago, what we did to our brothers. And when they saw the money in, 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 their, in their sacks, the scripture says, what, what is their response? They didn't say, oh, what has this man done to us? They say, what is, this, what, what is it that God has done to us? They recognize that the problems that they're going through is not man-made. They recognize that the problem they're going through is the consequences of the evil they have done to their own brother. That's why it says in 42, 28 of Genesis that what is it that God has done to us? It's not that what is that that has happened? How did this money come back? Some of us will say, oh, haba, so nice. I, I paid. I didn't have to pay. I have the money back. That's nonsense. You don't understand because you don't walk with the spirit of God. When you walk with the spirit of God, you, you're beginning to see you're, you've just come to the second in charge of the most powerful nation of the world. He has the ability to destroy you, to kill you. He's equivalent to God. Returning home, they tell their father what has happened. But Yaakov refuses to let Benjamin return to Egypt with them. Eventually, the food runs out. After much persuasion on the part of Judah, Yaakov allows Benjamin to accompany his brothers back to Egypt. This time, they come the second time. Yosef now greets them with warmth, releasing Shimon. He's now inviting them to eat with him. After providing them with fresh supplies of grains, he sends them on their way. Now, however, he does more than just place money back in their sacks the second time. He has his favorite divination cup placed in Benjamin's grave. The brothers have let the, left the city. They, they, they are relieved that the visit has been unexpectedly painless. No sooner they have gone then they were now overtaken by Joseph's stewards. What did the stewards say? Someone has stolen the master's silver cup. The brothers basically protest their innocence. We didn't take it. We didn't take it. We have no clue about it. The steward searches the bag, beginning from the eldest. Finally, they reach Benjamin. And there in his sack is the cup. The brothers worst nightmare has now come true. They knew that having come 
once come home without Joseph, they cannot lose Benjamin as well. Judah basically has staked his life on it. Remember the words of Judah. What did he say? In 3043 verse 9, he says, I, he, he, he told his father, I will guarantee whom? Benjamin's safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back, father, set me here I, 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 and set him here before you. I will bear the blame before you all my life. So the brothers appear before Yosef once more. And the drama now this week moves towards the climax. Now there are several possible readings of logic driving this drama that so puzzles, puzzles the brothers and the readers. What is the possible readings that we can have? First, the suggestion by the Torah itself, there it says that in 42 verse 9, that then he, Yosef, remembered the dreams about them and said to them what? You are spies. The minute he saw them, what was his dream? His first dream was that they're going to bow down. The, the sheaves basically bow down, bowing down. So when we, so he's seeing them and what is the first thing he's saying? He, he remembers his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. Is, it, is, is, is that Joseph was acting so to fulfill his childhood dreams in which his family bowed down to him? However, this cannot be the case. Why? Because Joseph acts like a stranger, we read. It says in 42 verse 6 that when Joseph's brothers arrived, they, they bowed down to him with their faces on the ground. Full, th this is basically fulfilling his dream. So what's, what's happening here? So are you all guys with me? So if the story was simply about the fulfillment of Joseph's second dream, he should have devised a strategy that would bring the whole family, including Yaakov, back to Egypt. Yaakov and all his brothers would have bowed down to him. The dreams would have, the dream would basically be fulfilled and Joseph could then reveal his identity. But none of these things happen. Joseph's action do not hasten or advance, but his actions in fact actually delay the outcome of, the, of his dream. It cannot be then that Joseph was acting simply to fulfill his dreams. That is the first possibility. The second possibility is that Joseph was, was, is, is driven by an urge for revenge. He's making his brothers suffer as they once made him suffer. This true also, this true cannot also be true because at every significant point of the passage in these last eight chapters, 42, 24, 43, 30, 45, 1 to, 5, 1 to 2, the scripture says, the Torah says that Yosef turns aside to weep, carefully not to let his brothers to see his state. People engaged in revenge do not weep when executing vengeance. So the Torah emphasizes his uncontrollable emotional response, repeating this detail three times, precisely to exclude the possibility that Yosef was acting out of a desire to do to his brothers what they had done to him earlier. Those who repay evil with evil take satisfaction in doing so. But that's not what is happening here in Joseph's case. Joseph does not take any satisfaction. He's, he's acting against his inclination. And it causes him unbearable pain. The question therefore returns in full force. What is the logic of Joseph's carefully constructed plot that we read in these last eight chapters? One of the keys of our faith, one of the themes of the holiest day of the year. What are the holiest days of the year? From Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. One main theme is what? The most important theme of between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is Teshuvah. What is Teshuvah? Even though we translate it in English as repentance, that's what Teshuvah is. 
Teshuvah is a very complex word. Teshuvah includes or involves remorse. It involves repentance. It, re- it involves returning. That's what Teshuvah is. Remorse, repentance, return. The abstract noun Teshuvah is post-biblical. But the idea of remorse, repentance, returning is always central to the Torah. This word basically is basically post-biblical. After all the events, the sages basically made this word. But the whole idea of remorse, repentance and returning has always been there. Teshuvah is a concept that the prophets called on Israel to do. It was, Teshuvah is the concept that Jonah called in Nineveh, the nation of Nineveh to do. It is, it is it, it, in a related sense, it is what certain sacrifices, meaning the guilt offering and the sin offering are intended to basically accompany. So Teshuvah is an, as analyzed by the sages and later on by the Rambam, has certain key elements. What are the three There are three key elements for Teshuvah. Number one, Teshuvah involves confession and acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Number one. Number two, Teshuvah involves to commit oneself not to repeat the offense. And number three, Teshuvah involves a complete repentance. Confession, acknowledging the wrongdoing. I'm wrong. I messed up. I was jealous. I, was, I had hatred. I did Lashon Hara. I, 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 I spoke bad about you. I thought bad about you. Confessing, acknowledging the truth. I did it. The problem with all of us is that we don't want to confess the truth. We don't want to say the truth. We want to show something else. We, we show an external something, but internally we have different kinds of emotions and intellects. And then we call ourselves believers of, of, of Yeshua. This is not how a believer of Yeshua should even live. It's very clear. I messed up. Taking Our, our ego does not allow us to, to, to do Yeshua properly. We always want to do blanket prayers. Oh, I repent for all my sins. What sins have you done? I know what I have done, but I don't want to spell it out. Because if I spell it out, what will others think about me? Because if I spell it out, you know, it's a difficult task. In fact, there's a story I heard of a, of a lady who was convicted of, of, of doing Lashon Hara. And, and she basically felt sick. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God told her, if you want to recover or if, if anything you want to do, you basically need to re- apologize. So the family had to take her home by home, city by city, to individuals she has basically done Lashon Hara, evil talk. To everybody she has basically slandered. To everybody she has criticized. She went home by home, little by little, one by one, and apologized for them. That's that's what Teshua is, friends. Teshuvah is not, oh, I'm sorry, don't worry, Lord, please forgive me. No, this is what Teshuvah is. You know who you wronged. You know what you said. You know what you thought. You know the intentions. You know your motives. You know it. And if you really want to do Teshuvah, you go and verbalize it and confess and say you're sorry and don't do it. That's what confession acknowledgement is. Because only if you do that, then only can you do the second one, which is not to repeat the offense. And only if you do that, then only you can come to the third part, which is complete repentance, where you live a life of freedom, where you live a life of joy, where you live a life of walking in the spirit of God. So the first is confession. Let's break it down. The first is confession and acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Listen to what the Rambam says in his Hilko Teshua. He says, How does one confess? The penitent, the sinner, the repentant should say, 
I beseech you, O Lord, I have sinned. I have acted perversely. I have transgressed before you. And I have done such and such. I repent. I am ashamed of my deeds. You know, one of the prayers that we say every day, Ashamlu, Gazanlu, I have cheated. I have wronged. I have betrayed. Why are we saying that? We're beating our chest and doing it. Are we telling God this is what is as if he doesn't know? He's the master of the universe. He's aware of what is his. So what is the point of us confessing it? Why are we doing it? It's not for Hashem. It's not for God. It's not for my neighbor. It's for me to see my own condition. To humble myself and say, Lord, I am a mess. I have pride. I have arrogance. I have betrayed. I have backstabbed. I have murdered. I have caused confusion. I have broken your body. I've not stayed in love. I don't know what it means to stay in love. I am messed up, but yet I call myself a believer. What believer are we? This is what the Rambam says. In fact, the same words of the Rambam is repeated by Apostle John in the Brit Kadasha. 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 through 10. He says, this is the message which you have heard, which, which we have heard from him. Who is the him? The master, Yeshua. And we proclaim to you. What did the master say? God is light and there is no darkness in him. In, in other words, that if you are saying that you are a believer, you believe in God. You believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. You're a believer of Yeshua, our master. You believe in the finished work. You're walking in grace. That means you should walk in his light. In the world to come, there is no lies. It's the world to come or the world of the heavens is known as a world of truth, emet. Emet means, that means I am going to live a life of truthfulness. You know, many times, you know, you, you, some of us should do this. Get for, for, for the next one month, you know, especially we are coming to the end of five, um, I mean, uh, 2023. We are entering into 2024 in exactly one week. Most of the time, everybody does New Year resolutions. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. I, I, I recommend you to doing one New Year resolution. Buy a book. And in this book, small, it should not be a big book, small book that you can put it in your pockets or in your wallets or your handbags, wherever it is. And every time you lie, make a note of it. Write the time, write the date. And in the end of the day, see for yourself how many times you have unnecessarily lied with no benefit. There is no benefit of your lying. I just did it because it just happened. Don't tell pastor, don't do this. Why? Did you do something wrong? If you did something wrong, only you don't have to tell me. By you telling don't tell is basically a sign that there is something wrong. There is something evil. That is a wrong intention. Yochan and John basically saying God is light. If you're walking with him, there is no darkness. That means there should not, there is no darkness in him and there cannot be any darkness in you. Have a life of truthfulness. Learn to accept the truth. The truth is bitter. Kadua. It is hard. It's better for your soul now rather than feeling cheated after your life is over on the earth. There are many people when it comes to the end of their life, they suffer a lot. The suffering is only because they were not willing to basically take time to work on their repentance before God. Because God is preparing them for the world to come. So the suffering is basically helping them, drawing them, putting them into a, that, that place that, will, that they will fall and say, God, please help me. I repent, basically to make recompense. And then he goes on to say, verse six, if we claim to have fellowship with him, meaning God, 
while we are having, walking in darkness. We are lying. What do you mean? I have fellowship with him, but I am walking in darkness. What kind of darkness is this? When I cheat, it is darkness. When I murder, oh, I don't do murder. Have you talked bad about somebody? Have you been arrogant? Have you been prideful? Have you been, have been hatred? Have you, have you have th evil thoughts about somebody? That's darkness. Have you done evil talk? Have you gossiped? Have you grumbled? Have you complained? It's darkness. He says that if you're doing that, you're, you're lying. You're not living in the truth. You're not received the truth. Yeshua said, I am the truth. I am Emmet. I am come from the world of Emmet. I go to the world of Emmet. You want to walk with me? You have to live a life of truth. Truth is acknowledging. Yes, I messed up. You know, it's hard to acknowledge the truth. It's hard to acknowledge I made a mistake. It's not an easy thing. But the one who does it is basically the conqueror. He's the one who is the winner. And he says, but if you are in the light, as he is in the light, what happens? What, is, what happens? Say it out. We have fellowship with whom? A stranger. Each other. The sad reality in most communities is that, we, 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 that, that that's why we don't, many people don't want to come to smaller communities is because in smaller communities, everybody interferes with your life. In a big, massive place, nobody's there to look into you. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of his son Yeshua purifies us. If we claim we have not been sinning, Oh, I have not been sitting. Have you grumbled? Have you complained? Have you talked evil? Have you had bitterness? You have sinned. We are, make, we are making him to be a liar and his word not with us. David Amalek in Psalms 32 verse 5 says, when, we when I acknowledge my sin to you, when I stopped concealing, hiding my guilt, I said, I will confess my offenses to Adonai. Confession, repentance. Lord, uh, Lord, I beseech you, I have sinned. I have acted perversely. I have transgressed before you. I have done such a thing, such a thing. I've talked this, I repent. I'm ashamed of my deeds. What did David Amalek say? When I do that, then you forgave the guilt of my heart. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 5 through 6 says, A person guilty of any of the things, what should he do? He should confess in what manner he has sinned. It can be a sin in action. It can be a sin in deed. It can be a sin in, by your mouth. And I, it's, not just, it's not just that you should confess. That is the next step also. Bring a guilt offering. Today we don't have, we don't, don't bring a guilt offering. I don't have the, we don't have the temple here. And this is not the temple of the Lord. This is a synagogue. So what offering should I bring? Bring a big offering to the Lord. That's what Zedekah box is all about. So the, 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 the first thing about Teshua is confession and acknowledgement of wrongdoing. The second is to commit oneself not to repeat the offense. The Rambam goes on to say, what is Teshua? It is that the sinner abandons the sin, removes it from his thoughts, resolves in his heart never to repeat it. As it is said in Isaiah 55 verse 7, let, let the wicked forsake his ways and the man of iniquity his thoughts. What should he do? Abandoning it, removing it from his thoughts and resolves in his heart never to repeat it. Yes, I've done Lashonara before. I've confessed. I went and saw the person. I've done it. I apologize. I got it right. Now I've decided even how much hard I feel like doing it, I'm not going to open my mouth. Titus, Shaul's advice to Titus 
in Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 14. He says, for God's grace, we all talk about God's grace, which brings deliverance. It has appeared to all people. And what does the grace of God teach us to do? How are you, brother? God's grace. To those who are under God's grace, listen to the words of Rav Shavul, Apostle Paul. He says, the grace of God teaches us to do what? Renounce godlessness and worldly pleasures and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives now in this age. What, 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 I mean, is that even possible? We're living in an even world. But it's, it's the grace of God. I'm living, yes, if, if, if it's the grace of God, are you living such kind of lives? Are you renouncing? Or how do I renounce it? Should I tell my neighbor? No, it's not about your neighbor, it's about me. I will not entertain godlessness. I will not entertain worldly pleasures. What is worldly pleasures? Pleasures that take me away from God. The industry, the worldwide industry, the ad world basically wants you to keep buying. Do you need it? No, you don't need it. Oh, I just see it. I, I, it, 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 it basically captivates my eyes and I want to buy it. That's what happened to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Her eyes saw it was pleasure. Leave it. Give it up. Oh, I think this guy is better than anybody else. This woman is better than anybody else. Give it up. These are all ways of the world. This is not what it means to walk in the ways of God. Then it says what? Live self-controlled. Not others controlled. We always want to control others. They should not do this. They should not do this. They... Hello? Self-control. You shut up. Live a life of control. That means don't cause your hormones to jut off. You, you get into any social media. It, it, it shows you pictures that, oh, I just want to click. It starts with a click. Self-control, don't click. Better control, throw that gadget away. The sad reality is it's not just that we have 20 emails. We have WhatsApp. We have Telegram. We have Signal. We have this. We have Twitter. We have, I, I, I'm lost. And then you say, I don't have time to walk with God. How will you have time to walk with God? How will you walk in, 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 the, in, in the ways of God when, when you are taken over by worldly pleasures? Live self-controlled lives. Live easy. Simple lives. Upright. Godly. Then what does it say? Because when you do that, while continuing to expect the blessed fulfillment of a certain hope, which is appearing, which is the appearing of the presence of God, the Shekinah of our great God, and appearing of our deliverer, Yeshua our Messiah. So, how long should we live this? How long should we renounce God, un -God uh, godlessness? How long should we renounce worldly pleasures? How long should we live self controlled lives? How long should we live upright and godly lives until the coming of the Lord? Because if you live this life, you will experience the coming of the Lord. You will experience the glory of God. You will experience the clouds of heaven. You will be walking in the spirit of God. The last condition for Teshua is what? There's a further condition. It is complete repentance. What does the Rambam say? The Rambam says, what is perfect Yeshua? This occurs when an opportunity presents itself for repeating the offense once committed and the offender is able to commit the offense but refrains from doing so because of the Teshua, not out of fear or failure of vigor. What the Rambam is telling is really, really powerful. He tells us about how do we know if we have really repented. In Hebrew it's called, how do we know we have become a Baal Teshua? Baal is master, Teshua is return, return, repentance. How do we know we have become masters of returning back to God? 
The Rambam says, Hashem puts you in the same place with the same woman, with the same sin, to see if you would sin again and say, that, or, or would you say that you had enough of it? Or you're, in other words, you're fed up of the sin. Same situation. Oh, before you did Lashonara to him, now the same situation has come again. What are you going to do? Are you going to do the same thing? Or are you going to say, I'm not going to do it? If you're going to do the same thing, repentance is not complete. If you're basically not going to say, I'm fed up if I'm not going to sin again, your repentance is complete. Hashem is going to put you in the same scenario. And see if you're going to sin with it again or not. Now when we, when you see a repetition of sin that you did. And you recognize it as if you have already been there. You have been in this place. It's like a deja vu. You have chosen not to do it. That's when you know that your, that your repentance, that you have completed your teshua. But if you have fallen... Your pride, your arrogance, your jealousy, your envy, your irritation, your anger, your blasphemy, your this, your that. If you have fallen for that sin again, it is obvious that you have not returned, you have not done Teshua and it is not complete. Are you with me? So as soon as we understand these three points by the Rambam. Now, the logic of Yosef's course becomes very clear of why he did what he did. The drama to which he subjects his brothers has nothing to do with his dreams. It has nothing to do with revenge. To the contrary, Yosef is not acting for himself but he's acting for the sake of his brothers. In other words, he's going out of his way to help his brothers also repent and reconcile. Many times we, we are only concerned about our repentance. Me, 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 me. But here is, 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 here is an individual should, that should be in, should be an example to us, just like our master Yeshua, who goes out of the way for the sake of his, the world. Do you act in a way that will help the person return back to God? Return back to the body? Return back to the community? Do you act in a way? Many times, oh, that's not my job, that's pastor's job. That's the leadership's job. What is your job? Just to come and warm the chair? then you have not really understood what it means to walk with God. Here, Yosef is leading them. For the first time in recorded history, he is leading them through these three stages of Teshuvah, which the Rambam just said. Recall what happened as a result of his intervention. His initial move was to accuse his brothers of the crime they had, had not committed. What is it? He said, you are spies. He held them in custody for three days to see whether this would basically remind them of a crime that they did. What was the crime that they did? They lied to their father. They sold their brother into slavery. Does that remind them? And what was it after being three days while they were in prison? What are the words of his brother? See what they say in chapter 42, 21 to 23 of Genesis. He says, they said to one another, Indeed, we are guilty. Of whom? Anaknu, our brother. We, because of our brother. All these things has happened because of what we have done. Why? Because we saw the distress of his soul. When he pleaded, he told us, when, when he was in the pit, don't do this, don't leave me. He cried. We would not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And the scripture says, they did not realize that Yosef could understand them because he was using an interpreter. Joseph was planning this. He wanted to see if really a change of heart is taking place. 
So following the first encounter with, with, with Yosef, what are the brothers doing? The brothers are confessing and they're expressing remorse for what they did. Remember, what was the first stage of Teshua to take place? Confession. I beseech you, O Lord, I have sinned. I have acted perversely. I have transgressed before you. I have done such and such a thing. I repent and I'm ashamed of my deeds. In other words, this is what Yosef brothers is doing. They're confessing of their sins. The second day is place far away from Yosef. But he has so arranged matters that he will know whether this has happened or not. What is it? What is Teshua? That the sinner abandons his sin, removes it from his thoughts, and resolves in his heart never to repeat it again. As it is said, let the wicked forsake his way and the man of iniquity his thoughts. What is the second? Joseph is now holding Shimon hostage. Now holding Shimon as hostage is also very significant. The Torah is not just throwing words to tell us a good fairy tale. Why? Because Shimon is the second oldest of the sons. By right, Joseph should have held Reuben. But now, by now, we know what has happened to Reuben. He's lost his firstborn ship basically because of the evil he has done. However, he knows that here, he also knows that Reuben was one of the brothers who tried to save him. Shimon is the, therefore the eldest of those who conspired to kill Yosef. He tells the brothers that he will be released only if they return with Benjamin. Benjamin. Knowing his father as he does, Yosef calculated rightly that Yaakov will not allow Benjamin to go if he's certain, will only allow Benjamin to go if he's certain that his sons will not let happen to Benjamin what, would, what had happened to Yosef. The father had to be sure. And this is indeed what happens. What, this is what Judah tells Jacob. See what he says, 43.9. He says, I myself guarantee. Benjamin's safety, I guarantee you. You can hold me personally responsible for him. It's not going to be like the past. It's not going to be like the time when Joseph went missing. If I do not bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. So the second condition of repentance has been now achieved. A commitment not to repeat the offense again. Judah undertakes not um, what Judah undertakes not, not to let happen this time, what happened last time. Namely, Jacob's sons returned without their younger sibling whose safety they should have guaranteed. They should have guaranteed the safety of Yosef returning. But that didn't happen 22 years back. Now 22 years later, he's guaranteeing Benjamin's safety. What is complete repentance? According to the Rambam, he says, this occurs when an opportunity presents itself for repeating the offense. Now, the same offense that they did to Yosef, the opportunity has come again in their life to repeat it. The, and the, this, the Judah is able to basically commit the offense. But now Judah refrains from committing the offense because of Teshua. Not because he's afraid. Not because he's, he's afraid of He's fearful or he's afraid that he will, he will lose. Nothing. Because he has truly repented is what the scripture says. So in other words, Yosef constructs a seed. One can call it a controlled experiment like we do in the chemistry labs to see if his brothers have indeed changed. They had once sold him into slavery. He, he now puts them in a situation in which they will have this overwhelming temptation to repeat the crime by abandoning Benjamin to slavery. This is why he plants the cup in Benjamin's sack, arranges for him to be accused of theft, rules that his punishment will be to remain in Egypt as a slave, 
and tells the other brothers they are free to leave. In other words, what is Joseph doing? He's recreating, like a movie, recreating the past. Benjamin, who is Benjamin? Benjamin, like Joseph, is the son of Rachel. And therefore, likely, just like Joseph, he's envied. Likely, most likely, he must be also dis despised by his brothers. The brothers' resentment of Joseph was heightened by jealousy. They felt, they felt at the same, the, the, they felt at the, the sight of that coat of many colored robe, that the, the sight of Joseph's multicolored robe that Jacob had given, it caused them to be envious. It caused them to be jealous. What is Joseph doing over here? He creates again the situation of this inequality. See what is he doing over here? After Benjamin is brought, 43, 34, he says, when he sits the brothers down for a meal, he arranges that they are seated in order of age, highlighting the fact that Benjamin is the youngest. And what does he do? He ensures that Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else. Why should he get more? Who the hell is he? Basically getting, trying to see if they're going to be jealous like they were with him. There's only one explanation for this strange detail that Yosef is trying to make his brothers jealous of their younger sibling. As far as possible, the circumstance of their original crime has now been replicated. Their younger brother, who is also the son of Raquel, is about to be taken as a slave in Egypt. The brothers have reason to be jealous of him as they were of Yosef. But this time, the only difference is they rose to the challenge. As Benjamin is about to be taken into custody, his brothers offer to join him in prison. And what does Joseph do? He declines. He says in 44, 17, Joseph said, far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who, has, who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you go back to your father in peace. The moment of trial has now begun. Yosef has offered the brothers a simple escape route. All they have to do is to walk away. But what does the scripture say? The scripture says in verse number 18, that Judah went up to Yosef and said, this is when the story reaches its climax. Judah, who is Judah? Judah is the very brother responsible for selling Yosef into slavery. Now he offers to sacrifice his own freedom rather than let Benjamin be held as a slave. The circumstances are similar to what they were years earlier. But Judah's behavior now is, di di uh, is, is, is diametrically opposite to what it was then. He has the opportunity and the ability to repeat the offense, but he does not do so. So in other words, Judah has fulfilled the conditions set out by the sages, especially the Rambam, about what is perfect Yeshua. And as soon as he does that, what does the Torah say? The Torah says that Yosef revealed his identity and this drama comes to an end. So in other words, this is, this whole drama, this whole experiment that Joseph is doing to lead his brothers to repent, return back to God, return to himself, is, is not about his dreams. This drama is not about revenge, but this is about Teshua is what has driven Joseph all along. Why? Because his brothers once sold him as a slave. He survived. He not only survived, but he prospered. And what does he say? He constantly again and again and again. One thing that Yosef again and again says is what? That everything that has happened to him is somehow part of God's plan. His, con his concern is not of himself, but his concern is about his brothers. Have they survived? 
Do they realize the depth of the crime that they have committed? Are they capable of remorse? Can they change? Do we have this kind of concern for our brothers and sisters in Mashiach? Do they have, do, will, will, are, are they able to return back? Are they able to reconcile? What can we do to help them reconcile? What have you done to help them reconcile? What have we done to show others the truth about the Jewishness of the Messiah, the mess gospel, the word of God? Have our brothers changed? Have people changed? Can we be that, that, that bridge to cause people to return? The entire sequence of events between the brother's first arrival in Egypt and the moment Yosef reveals himself to them is basically an extended essay of Teshua. A precise rehearsal of what will later become a law in our faith. And it must happen at this precise time. Why? Because unknown to any of the participants in this drama, the family of Abraham is about to undergo exile in Egypt. And prior to them becoming a nation under the sovereignty of God, that will place more demands on Israel on, than any other people in history. God knows that they will often fail. God knows that they will often sin. God knows that they will often complain. God knows that they will often worship idols. God knows that they will often break his laws. That he accepts. Though at times it gives him great grief, God does not demand perfection from any of us. By giving us free will, he empowers us to make mistakes. You have a free will. It's okay to make a mistake. But the question is, are we learning from the mistake? Are we stopping doing it? Are we able to bring people back to this faith? Bring people back to what we believe in? All he asks, all God asks is that we acknowledge our mistakes. Commit ourselves not to do it again in a word that we are capable of Teshua. Judah, by undergoing Joseph's test, he has demonstrated that the children of Israel has become Bale Teshua, master of re masters of repentance, capable of learning from their mistakes, growing from their mistakes, growing through their, and their mistakes. Jewish history, starting with exile and exodus in Egypt, could now is ready to begin. Are you with me? But as we conclude, I want to conclude with the main person in this Torah portion. Because the sequence from Genesis 37 to 5, chapter 50 is the longest unbroken narrative in the Torah. And there can be no doubt who this hero is. Yes, it is Joseph. The story in chapter 37 of Genesis begins with Joseph and it ends in chapter 50 with Joseph. We see him, we see Joseph as a child. We see him as a beloved. We even see him as spoiled by his father. And we see him as an adolescent dreamer. We see him as resented by his brothers. We see him as a slave. We see him as a prisoner in Egypt and then finally as the second most powerful figure in the greatest empire of the ancient world. At every stage, the narrative revolves around him and the impact it has on others. He dominates the last third of the book of Genesis, casting his shadow on everything else. From almost the beginning, he seems destined for greatness. Yet, history did not turn out that way. To the contrary, there is another brother who in the fullness of time who would leave his mark upon the Jewish people. We bear 
his name. The covenantal family was known by several names. The first name was Ivri, Hebrew, meaning one who has crossed over or from ancient word, an outsider, a stranger, a nomad, one who wanders from place to place, but he has crossed over. That is what Abraham and his children were known to others. The second, the covenantal family is known as is Israel. Israel derived from Jacob's new name after he wrestled with God and with man and he prevailed. After the division of the kingdom and the conquest of the north by the Assyrians, however, it became, they became known as Yehudim or Jews. For it was the tribe of Judah who dominated the kingdom of the south and it was they who basically survived the Babylonian exile. So in other words, it was not Joseph, but Judah who conferred his identity on the people. We are not known as Joseph's. We are known as Jews. Judah, Judah he ha- who became the ancestor of Israel's greatest king, David, Judah, from whom the Messiah will be born. The question is, why Judah? Why not Yosef? The answer undoubtedly lies in the beginning of this week's Torah portion, Pasha Vaigash. As the two brothers confront one another and Judah pleads for Benjamin's release, yet this final confrontation can only be fully understood in the context of Judah's initial behavior towards Yosef. In its, in, it, it is Judah in his recorded words who suggested the selling of Yosef into slavery. See what he did in chapter 37, verses 26 to 27. He says over there, Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover his blood? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not harm him with our own hands. After all, he's our brother, our own father flesh and blood and the brothers agreed this this is a speech of monstrous insensitivity it is cruel this it is disregarding of others there is in this in this in this in this passage over here there is there is no mention of evil of murder merely a pragmatic calculation what is it what will we gain what will we begin by killing him? At the very moment, he, at this very moment, he even calls Yosef. What will we gain by, by killing him? Who is our own flesh and blood? In other words, Yosef, Judah is proposing to sell him as a slave. Here, there is none of the tragic nobility of Reuben, who alone of the brothers sees that what they are doing is wrong. And he makes an attempt to save Yosef. At this point, Judah is the last person from whom we would expect great things. However, Judah, more than any else in the Bible or in the Torah, Judah changes. The man we see confronting Yosef all these years later, 22 years later, is not the same personality as the one who spoke when Yosef was trapped in the pit. Then he was prepared to see his brother sold into slavery. Now, in front of the second in charge of Egypt, he's prepared to suffer that fate himself, rather see Benjamin sold as a slave. See what he says to Yosef in 44 33 to 34. Now therefore, please, let your servant remain. Here as your lordship slave, in place of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. For how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that will come upon my father. Here, what do we see over here? Here we see a precise reversal of character. 
insensitivity, callousness has now been replaced with concern. Indifference to his brother's fate has now been transformed into courage on his behalf. Judah is now willing to suffer for what he once inflicted on Yosef so that the same fate should not fall on Benjamin. And at this point, Yosef reveals his identity. We know why. Ju why? Because Judah has now passed the test that Joseph has carefully constructed for him. Joseph wants to know if Judah has changed. Yes, it is not the same Judah that you saw 22 years ago. This is a changed Judah. This is, this is, this, this is a highly significant moment in the history of a human spirit. In other words, Judah is the first penitent or the first repentant. He's the first Baal Teshua in the Torah. He is the first man who basically acknowledged his sins and said, I am wrong, I messed it up, please forgive me. This did not happen suddenly because of a sudden change of character in the house of Pharaoh. It, it, it was set in motion by another event that happened between these two meetings. Namely with the meeting of Tamar. Who is Tamar? Tamar, we recall, had married Judah's elder two sons, both of whom have died, leaving her childless widow. Judah, fearing that his third son would share his faith, their faith, withheld him from her, thus leaving her unable to remarry and have children. Once she understands her situation, Tamar disguises herself as a prostitute. Judah sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant. Judah, unaware of the disguise, concludes that his daughter-in-law must have had forbidden relationships and orders her to be put to death. At this time, at this moment, Tamar, who while disguised had taken Judah's seal, his cord and staff as a pledge. And he sends them to Judah with a message. What is the message? The father of my child is the man to whom these belong. She doesn't tell anybody it was Judah. She doesn't tell, he, she doesn't pinpoint on anybody. She's just showing the, you know how I became pregnant? By the guy to whom these things belong. What things? The seal, the cord, and the stuff. The minute he sees it, he, Tamar is not putting down Judah. He's not exposing Judah. He's not telling anything bad about Judah. Nobody knows what has happened. Nobody is aware of what has happened. Judah, when he sees it, he understands the full significance because this Judah over here is not the same Judah. He has lost two sons. His two children have died. 22 years later, he has, he, his two old children died. Now he sees with the help of Tamar, there is something that has happened to him. There is a full significance. He had placed basically Tamar in a very impossible situation of, of, of living a widowhood. He is the father of the child. And more, he also realized that she has behaved with extraordinary discretion in revealing the truth without shaming him. He did not shame he did not shame him. Nobody knew that it was Judah. She revealed the truth, but nobody knew who it was. In other words, in that story, Tamar is the heroine of the story. But it, was, it, it has one significant consequence. What is the consequence after that incident? You know what? Judah admits he was wrong. You know what Judah said? Judah said, she was more righteous than I. Hands up. I surrender. I'm the one who made a mistake. This is the first time that in the Torah, someone acknowledges their own guilt. It is this which is the turning point in Judah's life. Here was born the ability to recognize one's wrongdoing, to feel remorse and to change. Judah understood what he did was wrong. He felt remorse. He repented, he confessed, 
and he changed. What is that? That is the complex phenomena called Teshuvah. He has done Teshuvah. This is the beginning of the process that later leads to the great scene in this week's Torah portion. Where Judah is capable of turning his earlier behavior on its head and doing the opposite thing of what he had once done. Judah is Ish Teshuvah. He is a repentant man. No sooner do we realize this than we understand the deep significance of his name. What is the significance of Judah's name? The root word, Hebrew, now for those of you who don't know Hebrew, he, every Hebrew word has a root word, a three letter root. That's why you need to learn Hebrew. The root of Yehuda is Lahadot. The Hebrew word Lahadot has two meanings. Lahadot basically means to thank. This is what Leah, his mother had in mind when she gave birth to Judah, the fourth son, where she said, this time I will thank the Lord. Lehidot means to, to thank. And the second meaning of the word Lehidot means to admit, to acknowledge. Judah this doesn't just mean thanking God. Lehidot means to admit. To acknowledge. It is from this we get the biblical term vidui, confession. Then and now part of the process of teshua, which is the, a key element of repentance. A key element of uh, repentance is what? Confession. Re there is no repentance without confession. Firstly, confession to others. You know, in this whole story, what do we learn about Joseph? Yes, Joseph forgave his brothers. He had no revenge. He was not fulfilling his dreams. He forgave. But for the brothers to experience freedom, they had to confess. I can say, oh, somebody hurt me. Yes, what is my job? To repent, release them, let them go. But if that other person does not come and acknowledge their sin and repent of their sin that they did to me, their repentance is not complete and they're going to bear the consequences of it in the world to come. Joseph was concerned for their soul. He was concerned what is going to happen to them if they don't get it right over here. So that is why he put all this drama to make sure that they would basically turn. Reconciliation would happen with one another and with God. Lehadot, Yehuda, Lehadot, to thank, to admit, to acknowledge. Judah, Yehuda means he who acknowledged his sin. Acknowledging his sin, Judah also demonstrates one of the fundamental axioms of Teshua. This is what the sages say in Barakot 34b. Rabbi Abihu said, in the place where a penitent stands, basically a repentant person stands, even the perfectly righteous cannot stand. In other words, the one who repents is on a much higher level than the one who is perfectly righteous. How do they come to this conclusion? The proof text for Rabbi Abihu is from Isaiah chapter 57 verse 19, where he says, Isaiah 57 19 says, Peace, peace to him that is far and to him that is near, which puts one who is, was far ahead than the one who is near. There are two times peace. Shalom, shalom. First shalom is to the one who is far and the second shalom is to the one who is near. The sages make it very clear. The sages say the statement of Rabbi Abihu's reading is by no means uh, uncontroversial. It's very difficult to understand. But Rabbi Yochanan, he interprets this as says, the word far is far from sin rather than far from God. 
Shalom to the one who is far from sin. Shalom to the one who is repented. Shalom to the one who has repented. Shalom to the one who has returned. Shalom to the one who is about to shua. Shalom because now you are on a higher madrega, higher level than them who claims I have no sin. Who behaves, that's the super spiritual people. This is powerful. The real proof of this is Judah himself. You remember the story I just said in the beginning. Joseph was consistently known by tradition as Zadik, the righteous. Judah is repentant. He's feeling and showing sorrow. He's showing regret. He's of what he has done wrong. He's repentant. Judah is the first person who has repented in the, in the Torah. You want to know what it means to live a life of repentance? Look at the life of Judah. Hashem is calling us to be like Judah. Be people who are willing to stand up and say, yes, I messed up. I did Lashonara. I talked evil. I grumbled. I lied. I murdered. I did this. I did that. I behaved unruly. I had anger. I have impatience. I don't have control of myself. I've given myself to the ways of the world. Confession. Repentant. Turning to God. Yosef became second to the king. Yosef, however, became the father of the kings of Israel. Joseph was Zadik, but he only reached the second to the king. Judah, Yehuda, he's the father of all the kings, even David Hamelech. Where the penitent Judah stands, even the perfectly righteous Joseph cannot stand. However great an individual may be in virtue of his or her natural character, greater still is one who is capable of great growth and change. You might have a great character. You might have natural giftings. But you know what? The one who is able for growth and change is greater than you. That, my friends, is the power of repentance and the power of being a true Balteshua, a penitent, and it all began with our father, our ancestor, Judah. Many times I've told during Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur atones for our sins against God, but not for our sins against other human beings. Joseph does more than forgive. He wants to make sure that his brothers, especially Judah, has changed. Yes, I have forgiven. But am I making an effort to see others who have offended me has returned? Have they changed? Joseph wants to know, is Judah no longer able to sell others into slavery like he did? Is he a changed man? Nor is it Judah alone who has to change. Joseph also had to change. Joseph had to rethink the entire sequence of events. He no longer sees it in terms of a wrong done against him by his brothers. He sees it as a part of divine providence. A providential plan to bring him where God needed him to be. That is why he said, it was not you who sent me here, but it was Hashem. He thinks not only of the moment 22 years earlier when he, is, he was sold as a slave, but of its long-term consequences. It is as if Joseph has come to terms with himself before he can do so with his brothers. And this is why forgiveness lifts the one who forgives even more than the one who is forgiven. You who forgive is coming out of your prison than the one you have actually forgiven. 
That is why I said, we can forgive somebody, but that somebody also has to ask for forgiveness and return to God to work. And the idea of forgiveness is to return back. But the real significance of this passage goes beyond the story of Joseph and his brothers. It is essential. The book of Genesis is a prelude to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is a place where Israel now becomes a nation. Genesis is among other things, a set of variations of things. What is one of the themes that we see consistent all throughout in the book of Genesis? Sibling rivalry. Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Yaakov and Esau, Joseph and his brothers. The, the book begins, the book of Genesis begins with fratitude and ends with reconciliation. This is a clear pattern to the final scene to all the, each of the narratives. Cain and Abel, what happened to their relationship? It ended up in murder. It ha- the first murder in the Bible happens over here. Isaac and Ishmael, they could, Ishmael could not see Isaac. They just parted ways. But they came together for their father Abraham's funeral. Yaakov and Esau, yes, they were far away. They meet, they embrace, but they go separate ways. Joseph and his brothers, forgiveness, reconciliation, coexistence. If Joseph is a type of Mashiach, this is what the Messiah expects of us who claim to be believers of Messiah. Forgiveness, reconciliation, coexistence. Are we able to do that? Can we restore people back? The Torah is making a statement of the most fundamental kind. Historically, psychologically, families precede society and the state. If brothers cannot live together in peace, then they cannot form a stable community, a stable society, and a cohesive nation. If brothers cannot live together, not separately, together, because Joseph and his brothers, what happened? Forgiveness, reconciliation, coexistence. The Ramam explains that forgiveness and the associated command where it says in Leviticus 19, 18, not to bear a grudge, is essential to the survival of a society. The Rambam says, for as long as one nurses a grief, grievance and keeps it in mind, one may come to take vengeance. The, the, the Torah emphatically warns us not to bear a grudge so that the impression of the wrong shall be quite obliterated and be no longer remembered. This is the right principle. It alone makes civilization and human relations possible. Let's see this again. Put the next slide. This is what the Rambam is saying. He's basically beginning by quoting Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where it says, anyone who holds a grudge against another Jew we can call it another believer, violates a Torah prohibition of Leviticus 19.18, where it says, do not bear a grudge against the children of Israel, children of your people. What is meant by bearing a grudge? They asked the question. Ruben asked Shimon, rent this house to me or lend this ox to me. And Shimon was not willing to do so. A few days later, Shimon came to borrow or rent something from him. Ruven told him, here it is. I'm lending it to you, but I'm not like you. Nor am I playing, I'm, nor am I paying you back for what you did. Are you understanding what I'm saying? One asked for something and this one said, no, it's not possible. 
Couple of days later, this other came and asked for something and he said, here it is, but remember, I'm not like you. You didn't give me, but I'm giving you. Okay? And you know what? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing this to pay you back for what you did. That's what it's basically saying. So in other words, the sages are saying, a person who acts in this kind of manner, tit for tat, you didn't give me? Okay, I'll give you. I'm giving you to show you that I am not like you. <laughs> That's what is happening over here. So the person who acts in this manner violates the prohibition against bearing a grudge. Instead of doing so, he should wipe this matter from his heart and never bring it to his mind. And as long as he brings this matter to mind and remembers it, there is a possibility that he will seek revenge. Therefore, the Torah condemned holding a grudge regarding one to wipe the wrong from his heart entirely without remembering it at all. This, the sages say, is the proper quality which permits a stable environment, trade, and commerce to be established among people. You want to live in peace? This is the idea. Because the Bible is all about peace. When we give the Aaronic blessing, peace. When we, we, when we do the Amida, it's about peace. O say Shalom Mimruma. It's all about peace. All throughout in the Breath Kadasha, what is it about? Peace, peace, peace. Live in peace with one another. Peace with one another. Peace with one another. It's because without peace, we cannot, with, without peace with one another, we cannot have peace with God. So in other words, forgiveness is, is not merely per personal, it is, it is political. When you release forgiveness and receive forgiveness, it's not just a personal thing. You're going to make a change in the community. You're going to cause a community that is going to show forth the good deeds of the Lord. So it is, it, it is essential, forgiveness is essential to the life of a nation if it is to maintain its independence for long. When people lack the ability to forgive, they are unable to resolve conflict. You wonder why conflicts cannot be resolved. Conflicts cannot be resolved because we lack the ability to forgive. When people lack the ability to forgive, they are unable to resolve conflicts. Joseph forgave, he resolved. Judah forgave, he resolved. Yeshua taught us to forgive and he asked us to resolve. Are we willing to go that extra mile like Yosef to see that if our brothers have also made restitution, reconciliation and coexistence? Are we willing to go that extra mile like Judah and say, yes, I messed up, but now I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to stand on the gap and I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to suffer on behalf of somebody else. I'm going to take the blame so that there would be restitution, reconciliation, forgiveness and, and, and coexistence in the community. When people lack the ability to forgive, they are unable to resolve conflict. And when you are unable to resolve conflict, what happens? The result is division, factionalism, fragmentation of a community and nation and every sect and every group. So finally, in conclusion, what is the message from Pasha Vayagash? It's very clear. Those who seek freedom must learn to forgive. You want freedom? Learn to forgive. You shall, Yeshua said, when you do everything I tell you to do, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. People are sometimes super spiritual. They want to do things in competition. They want to do things in jealousy. They want to do things for ulterior motives. But in the end, it is the master of the universe who sees our hearts. 
friends why are you doing what you're doing why is it so difficult for us to come together for the sake of the gospel for the sake of the mashiach and to see a united front the un for unnecessary reasons are able to stand united we who claim ourselves believers in yeshua for the right reasons we have no response we like to break we like to divide we like to run we want to do all our own thing those who seek freedom must learn to forgive